Hello everyone, my name is Nicole, and today I'll be telling you about our process nucleosynthesis. Uh, just for a quick background about myself, I did my PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with Baja Balantican studying neutrino physics. For the last few years, I've been studying the R process with Rebecca Sermon at the University of Notre Dame. And very soon, I'll be moving on to join the Triumph Theory Group. So just for a quick note to start, uh, summer schools in my own personal education were just a very, very valuable supplement. And so I would like to encourage the young people to do as many of these summer schools as you can. You really learn things you wouldn't otherwise, and you get to know people within your community. And these junior people are going to come back and be some of, your, some of your greatest friends in the future and some of your future collaborators as well. So I'd just like to encourage you to pursue these summer schools. And I would like to thank the organizers for putting together this summer school and the opportunity for me to talk to you about the R process. So to start, this is my outline of the things we will be discussing. And here I also explicitly have noted the different slide numbers so that this recorded lecture can be navigated a bit more easily. And you should be able to see the, uh, the slide numbers up in the right corner for, for reference. So we're going to start by looking at the observational evidence that the R process occurs. How do we even know that there is such a thing as a rapid neutron capture process? So first of all, let's start close to home in our solar system with our own sun. If you take a look on the left, these are the abundances of different elements seen within our sun. And on the right are in the periodic table form is listed the different places where we think that these have dominantly been produced. So as we can see, the R process or rapid neutron capture process is the one that produces the heaviest of the elements that we see. Um, and that's what we're gonna focus on today. So some early work, uh, some pioneering work by, by Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle can be seen here, where now those solar abundances that we just shown are shown here as a function of atomic weight. So this is neutrons plus protons, okay? So this in the heaviest regions can be explicitly to be seen to be um, a composition, a, a combination of the R process and the S process. So what is that? That's the rapid neutron capture and the slow neutron capture process. Both of these neutron capture processes proceed through a series of neutron captures followed by beta decays. You have to beta decay in order to make your next heaviest element and so on through the nuclear chart. But there's some key differences with these two different types of processes. The S process occurs closer to stability, as can be seen here, whereas the R process proceeds further from this black line of stability here into the very neutron-rich regions. So how do we even know that there is this R process that goes far away from stability? Well, one of the first hints at this that was noted in Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle are the peaks. So if you take a look, you're going to at some point stop capturing neutrons and begin decaying back towards stability. For the S process, you're going to not be very far from stability, but for the R process, if you're very far from stability, you can see that that's going to produce the shift in the peaks here. So you can explicitly see that over here. Now these peaks in general are, are coming from the fact that at these neutron numbers, you have especially stable species. These are called neutron magic, magic numbers, or um, these are called shell closures as well. So this one at 50 and this one at 82 are mapping exactly to these two peaks here. Okay, so that's your first evidence that the R process actually occurs um, in nature. Now, just some quick terminology that we will be hearing as we move forward. 
this right here is going to be your R process uh, solar residuals or just the R residuals for short. It's what you get when you take the solar pattern and you subtract out the S process. So keep in mind that whenever you're trying to take a look at the R process content of the solar system, you have to take out that S process piece first. Now here is the R process first peak, second peak, and third peak. And this little peak right here is called the rare earth peak, which is currently of uncertain origin. These are connected to shell closures, but this could be connected to some, some more subtle form of nuclear structure. And we'll talk about that later. Okay, so moving forward with what other kind of evidence do we have that there is in our process? Well, we observe actinides. So we not only observe actinides in our sun, but we in other stars, in meteorites, in deep sea ocean crusts. So there's several places that we see that nature has produced actinides and we need some way to get to them. Well, I'm sure you've heard from Amanda about how the S process proceeds and it terminates in lead 208. So the S process cannot reach these actinides. We need some way of producing actinides. And in fact, we see them in other stars, as I mentioned, and some stars are even boosted very much relative to the solar system. So you have these so-called actinide boost stars, which show a lot of actinides present. Um, additionally, in meteorites, meteorites are a very interesting place where, where you can see actinides. This is a particular sample that I wanted to point out, and we will talk, to, talk about a little bit more at the end, Curious Marie, which shows an access of uranium-235. Okay. All right, so in addition to these evidences that there is an R process, we also know from some observables that the R process must be coming from a rare event. So how do we know this? Well, I have a couple of, of plots here to demonstrate this. On the left, we see plutonium measurements in deep sea ocean crusts, that's these points here, as compared to a model which would assume a source as frequently as supernova is what would be responsible for, for the plutonium production. And you can see that we're just falling under what you would expect with a more frequent type of event. Down here, you can see an updated study relative to this, this older study where they were able to measure many, many more atoms of plutonium. And this shows explicitly that the plutonium that they see is not just coming from those nuclear weapons testing that happened in relatively recent years, a few decades back, because we see access of plutonium relative to something that's, that's not as long lived um, within the deeper layers of uh, the, the crust. Additionally, over here is, um, points for europium in our process element observed in a dwarf galaxy, Reticulum 2, as compared to other dwarf galaxies, the colored points, and our Milky Way in the gray points. So you can see that this particular galaxy is very enhanced in our process elements, and that this is not always the case within other galaxies. So it seems like it doesn't uh, happen all that often that you have a strong enrichment from the R process. Okay, so hopefully now I've convinced you that the R process has to be occurring somewhere and that that is very likely from some rare type of event. So now let's talk about the astrophysical sites at which the R process could occur. Okay, so this question of looking at different observables to try to understand what events are enriching the heavy element content of our solar system um, can be looked at through a picture like this. So how do we look at the sun and we see other elements in it, things like uranium, which in no way are being produced by our sun? So what's happening is that you have something like a, a, a red giant, a heavy star that's undergone, it's, uh, it's towards the end of its life cycle. It's going to pollute uh, the interstellar medium with heavy elements. That star could also undergo um, a supernova. It could collapse and eject more uh, heavy elements into the interstellar medium. The neutron star remnant 
could then be produced, bind another neutron star, and then that collision can inject heavy elements into the interstellar medium. And then this is where the stars form. So the stars form in gases that are already polluted with heavy elements, and this process can, can go on and on. So the, the calculations that take a look at this are called galactic chemical evolution. And some of our first arguments as to where the R process might be happening and the fact that it used to be favored in supernova were coming from galactic chemical evolution arguments. So let's take a look at some of those early considerations. So it's been looked at over, over uh, 30 years now. These very low metallicity stars here were a topic of, of debate for a while and, and seemed to be pointing to supernova. As you can see here from some um, more elaborate, uh, sophisticated galactic chemical evolution simulations, if you have something that turns on early, like supernova, as compared to something like mergers, where it takes time to produce a neutron star and it takes time for those neutron stars to merge, you can explain these low metallicity stars where here in this type of picture you struggle. So these were some early arguments in favor of supernovae. Nowadays, uh, more elaborate simulations of galactic chemical evolution, which take into account the hydrodynamics, have found ways around this. There are ways around this argument now where you can have inhomogeneities in your interstellar medium. And then once you have mixing between different regions in, in this inhomogeneous medium, that can explain how your R process elements can find their way to lower metallicity regions. So early arguments, very, very interesting that potentially, you know, this is hinting at something that, that turns on earlier in galactic history, but, but nowadays that argument has some holes. Okay. Additionally, supernova simulations in the past had demonstrated that potentially, yeah, we could produce an R process in supernova via a neutrino-driven wind mechanism. So neutrinos come off of the proto-neutron star, a lot of the binding energy, something like 99% of the binding energy is liberated in neutrinos when you have a core collapse supernova. And they're in the most dense region such that matter is actually opaque to neutrinos. So it's going to interact with all of these different species that are present. And it's through these weak interactions that you are going to change and adjust what we call your neutron to, to proton ratio or, or your YE. So it determines your neutron richness, these weak interactions. And this is what in, in early works was thought to actually drive the supernova shock out, that you have these neutrinos coming through and heating your material, and then also producing conditions that could be favorable for an R process. However, modern simulations within the last 15 years no longer support um, supernova as a site where you can produce the heaviest species past that second R process peak at about an A of 130. There are other processes that can occur within supernova, alpha N, nu P, that can reach something like a mass number of 100, but nevertheless, we're not proceeding past that R process second peak and into the heaviest regions. And actually, even very recently, some simulations found that they did have some of their cases develop neutrino-driven winds, but this was not a standard feature for a successful explosion. So, and additionally, you can see the nucleosynthesis here, again, not reaching past that second peak. So never, so although these are very important, supernova are very, very important contributions to uh, the enrichment of the galaxy, for our process, it's seeming an unlikely source, these core collapse supernova. You'll hear more about supernovae and neutrinos from Takaka Gino later this week. So, so I would encourage you to, to talk to him about these things um, if you have any more questions. Okay, so then if it's not supernova, what is it? Well, uh, these here listed are a few candidate sites for our process heavy element production. 
So um, these are not, this is not an exhaustive list I wanted to point out. These are just some examples of what, what may be producing our process that you will find discussed either recently in the literature or, or favored by the literature. So one is when you have a massive progenitor star undergo collapse and then have an accretion disk form around it. But whether or not you produce an R process in this case, depends upon several complex inputs into the hydrodynamic simulations. And some recent simulations favored this production and, and others did not. So it depends on, on where you look um, in terms of what if you think that these are a R process source. Uh, Magneto rotationally driven supernova are an interesting candidate. These are um, cases where the magnetic fields are very, very high, such that they're actually ripping neutron rich material off of the proto neutron star and then within this ejecta you can undergo an R process. Another case that has come up as an idea within the literature is that you could have a primordial black hole be captured by a neutron star. It eats the neutron star from the inside out so that that neutron star spins up and then sheds neutron rich matter as it spins. But this is something that has yet to be shown by simulation to actually have ejecta become unbound. Okay, so a spotlight on MHD supernova. We're gonna see some results from MHD supernova calculations. And I'm also going to use this case to demonstrate some terminology that you may see in the R process literature. So, MHDs may undergo a weak R process. A weak R process is something that proceeds to the second R process peak, but then just falls off. So it doesn't really go into these heaviest element regions. Or it could produce a main R process or a strong R process. Main R process is something that makes it beyond the second peak through to the third peak. And strong is when you go all the way to the actinides. So whether or not MHDs do a weak, a main, or a strong depends on a couple of inputs within the simulations, one of which is the neutrinos. So you can see explicitly here, when you change the neutrino luminosities, you're getting different reaches for your R process. And this particular simulation only saw a weak R process produced. Now, as far as the magnetic field strength, you can see here, these are a couple of different cases where they adjusted the magnetic field uh, amongst other inputs, but they're all for the same type of progenitor star, just other inputs along with the magnetic field were changed. And the one with the highest magnetic field is this red line, and that's the one that's able to make your main R process. So this is a very active area of study. It's of high interest to the community to know whether or not MHDs can make the majority of R process elements or exactly what R process elements they can make, but this is influenced by our treatment of neutrinos and magnetic fields. Okay, so let's talk about neutron star mergers. So you may have seen discussions of neutron star mergers or you heard people talk about neutron star mergers in the, in the R process. Um, this is something that in the literature right now is a very hot topic and we'll talk about why in just a little bit. But first I wanted to point out that this is something that has been discussed for a very long time, for over 40 years. This was proposed as a potential R process site just because you have a lot of neutrons. You have the ability to get out very neutron rich matter from, from these types of events. So in mergers, there are actually a few places in which the R process could be taking place. So these here are called the tidal tails. Those are ripped off early within, um, within the merger. And then you can also have our process at this collisional interface. This is called hot shocked ejecta. You could also have it occur there. So there are a couple of different locations in which the R process could occur. Nevertheless, still we have influences from how you're treating the neutrinos within these simulations. And more modern simulations, when they adjust how they're treating their, their neutrinos, they're seeing different different neutron rich um, 
distribution. So this determines your neutron richness. You saw, we saw this definition of Ye earlier. It's your number of protons over your number of neutrons plus protons. So if you have something that's lower here, it's more and more neutron rich. And you can see that the distribution is, is highly affected by how they're seeing neutrinos or how they're treating neutrinos. So sometimes they have something that undergoes a weak R process, and sometimes they have something, they have components that undergo a strong R process, and you have to put together all of these different types of ejecta in order to see your total um, composition or your total predicted composition. So that's, that's one thing to consider um, within dynamical ejecta. Another thing is the equation of state of dense matter. This is something that is unknown. And if you do different treatments of dense matter, you can get different predictions for your neutron richness, for the distribution of your neutron richness within dynamical ejecta. So another way in which our process could occur from mergers is actually post-merger and accretion disk can form. And you can have material be driven from the secretion disk through various mechanisms. So it can be magnetically driven, it can be neutrino driven, it can be viscously driven. And the nature of the outflow is going to determine how far the R process can proceed or whether or not it occurs, et cetera. So you can see here explicitly that something that's neutrino driven is kind of falling off and more favoring a weak R process. It's not really producing a strong third peak here versus something that's viscously driven is giving us a very strong R process here where we have a third peak and we even have some actinides. This is a more modern simulation that really just confirms the importance of neutrino physics within wind calculations. It's demonstrating as a function of angle, your neutron richness. And this as a, as a function of angle is being determined by the neutrinos as a function of angle. So the different neutrino interactions are affecting your different uh, distributions as a function of angle as well. Additionally, as we mentioned, that uh, dense matter equation of state is playing a role in what you may think your neutron richness would be within a disk. And you can see here two different equa equation of state prescriptions that were applied predicted very different um, neutron richness in their outflows. So these are still in, in the simulation phase. There's a lot of um, interesting work remaining to be done, but these are our candidates for, for the R process as well. Okay, so we discussed that neutron star mergers um, are a favored source for our process, but let's get back to GC and let's ask the question of um, what, what can they really make? Could they make everything that we see? So let's consider that. So previously we were looking at these stars, which were the low metallicity stars, but now let's look at these stars, the disk stars right here. So there's this downward trend that galactic chemical evolution simulations have a hard time reproducing when they take into account the fact that there's a delay time associated with the neutron stars being made and finding each other. So this is the type of trend that you get from a GCE calculation, which takes into account delay time. This is the type of trend that you need. So if you do a subtraction, you can see this residual europium here, which is hinting at a potential earlier source. So if you try to just say, okay, neutron star mergers, what if they're the only source? You're gonna miss some europium here at least, okay? So although neutron star merger is very interesting, favored candidate for, for some R process, um, they're not the full story, okay? But why are we so obsessed with neutron star, neutron star mergers? Why did I spend a longer time here discussing mergers than, than the other candidate sites? Well, one of the reason is about four years ago now, we saw a multi-messenger event. We saw the gravitational waves from a neutron star, neutron star merger, followed by its electromagnetic counterpart. So let's talk about that multi-messenger event. So first of all, what is a multi-messenger event? 
Uh, so there's a famous example here that I'm going to use to, to illustrate what is a multi-messenger event, supernova 1987A. It's a famous core collapse supernova. We already discussed that neutrinos play a really big role in uh, supernova uh, nucleosynthesis and how, how much energy is liberated as supernovas or sorry, as, as neutrinos. And actually the neutrinos from this event were seen before the light curve came. So this was a multi-messenger event where your messengers were neutrinos and light. Another thing that I wanna point out is within the light curve, we see the influence of the nuclear physics properties. The way in which this light curve decays is dependent upon the half-lives of the nucleosynthetic uh, elements present. So very interesting stuff. You can determine what elements are present. You can know things about the neutrinos and the energies. Multi-messenger events can teach you good stuff about astrophysical sites. So let's take a look at this neutron star, neutron star merger, multi-messenger event. This is the gravitational wave signal that was seen by LIGO. Here are, and it's this little dot here, are what was seen in the electromagnetic spectrum at a couple of different wavelengths. This event was observed across the electromagnetic spectrum because something like 70 observing teams followed up when LIGO gave the alert that they had seen this event, telescopes were turned in its direction and we got a lot of really good information. So this highlights that the community was very invested um, and interested in this particular event. So this movie here is going to demonstrate what we think happened in this event, just in a schematic way, of course. So you have the neutron stars merging, gravitational waves, gamma ray burst, early blue glow in the optical, followed by a late time red emission. Okay. So let's talk more about that, the light that was seen from that event. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about a key input in modeling the light from that event. The, the light curves from these events are called kilonova. So a key input in kilonova calculations is opacity. So I have listed here a couple of sources of opacity for your photons within this medium, where this one is the most important for neutron star merger ejecta. That's photoelectric absorption, where a photon is absorbed or emitted as an electron moves between energy levels. So that's demonstrated over here, where you have an incoming photon hits an electron, and then that electron just moves to a different energy level. So what this means for the R process is the following. If you have the presence of elements within this F block, of the periodic table, they have many, many more levels at which a photon can be absorbed. This means that they have higher opacities. Therefore, it's going to take photons a longer time to escape the medium. So now that we know that, let's take a look at modeling and what lanthanides do to your kilonova models. Here you can see that when you have more lanthanides, you're shifting the light curve towards longer times. It takes those photons longer times to get out. So you have it shifted towards a longer duration light curve and towards the infrared, as can be seen here. So this is why sometimes you may have heard things like blue kilonova, red kilonova. So the blue is associated with elements that were produced in this regime, and the red is associated with elements in this regime and or the actinides. So as we saw, both lanthanides and actinides are high opacity elements, and so they could both, either one or them together, could boost your opacity and cause these types of effects. So now let's compare to the actual observed light curve. Here it is on the right. You can see that early, so this is as a function of days, the apparent magnitude of that light in different, the different photometric bands in which they observe. So you can see the early blue emission falling off 
And then we're dominated by that late time or not super late time, but, but this on the order of a few days red emission here. So you see this little bump around five days from when you have lots of lanthanides, you can see that showing up explicitly here, you have this little bump, okay? And you also see the dominance of this infrared emission. So this is the evidence that there were at least lanthanides produced in this event, but that doesn't necessarily mean actinides. As you can see, the lanthanides are here, actinides way up here. So we could have just produced these and fallen off before we got over here. There's still some things to investigate here. Additionally, if you heard anything about gold, I wanted to quickly mention gold is here in the third R process peak. So a signature of lanthanides is not indicative that you made a lot of gold per se. It, it's, this is a matter of debate within the literature, I would say but you can reach the lanthanides and kind of fall off and only produce some gold, okay? So it's, it's not a closed case, but you can see for yourself the evidence of at least lanthanides. All right, so what about individual elements? We just talked about a feature that we saw in the light of this event from a, a uh, sort of a block of elements, a, a type of elements. But could we see something that's indicative of a particular element? Well, in, in a, in a re relatively recent work, they went back and reanalyzed the spectrum of this event, and they saw a feature from strontium. Now they were able to see this, even though this event was pretty far away, because this is a strong and broad absorption feature and it's distinct. It's in a distinct region um, with respect to wavelength relative to where you may see things from, from lanthanides, for example. So if you have something that's very distinct, very strong, you may be able to pick out something from an individual element as in fact they did for this event. So now we know lanthanides were produced and strontium was produced. Very interesting stuff. But if you wanted to get at individual lines, some, some kind of emission from an individual uh, a line, that's, that's something that is, is just not um, within the realm of what current detectors can do when something like this happens very far away. This, this event was 40 megaparsecs away, too far away for our detectors to be able to pick out individual lines. So another thing that's been popular to do in the recent literature is actually do calculations of what a neutron star merger remnant might look like what, their, what the line emission might look like at later times, here it's at uh, 10 kilo year, to try to see if we go looking for remnants, could we see a remnant and identify something unique in that remnant that says a neutron star merger occurred and that's what that is. So this is at 10 kiloparsecs within our Milky Way. So it would, it would have to be something that occurred within our Milky Way a while ago. We could go looking for it for, for individual lines. But for, for things like this, which are, which are pretty far away, we don't really have hopes of that, but it's really exciting that they were able to see something like this with a broad absorption feature. Okay, so we've seen this this evidence that neutron star mergers make our process elements. But the question is really not only do they make them, but do they make enough of them? Do they make a lot of them? Do they explain what we see in the solar system on, on their own? So we're gonna return to our picture of galactic chemical evolution, and we're gonna compare what we're gonna get out of this simulation with the neutron star neutron star merger rate that LIGO reported from this particular event. So this is something that's a really key thing that we get out of LIGO is the neutron star neutron star merger rate, how frequently they're occurring. And that's a key thing to know if you want to know whether mergers make enough to explain heavy uh, solar system elements. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our galactic chemical evolution simulation and we're going to couple it with estimates for the mass ejection range from GW170817. So the literature had all sorts of estimates in the mass ejection range based upon the light curve. 
This is demonstrated here, how the mass ejection affects the shape of the light curve. Then we're going to input nucleosynthesis predictions. So what we did here was to take 10 different mass models and do abundance calculations with dynamical ejecta simulation tracers. So this is your abundance pattern that you get out and the band again is from 10 mass models. I just wanted to note here that it's super important if you're trying to answer this question to use nucleosynthesis predictions rather than just assuming your solar abundances as is sometimes done within the literature and within GCE calculations. Because if you've assumed your solar pattern, you've kind of already answered your question. So you should really be careful, move from nucleosynthesis predictions, and that's what we did here. So now when we take this range for the mass ejection from the literature, and we take this range on europium specifically, from our abundance uh, calculations with nucleosynthesis, this is what we get. So this is just from GCE uncertainties. This is the band that we see. This is how many mergers we would need within our GCE simulation in order to be able to explain the solar system enrichment given these ranges. And this light blue band here is when you take into account these nuclear physics uncertainties. So you can see explicitly that the nuclear physics inputs are playing a role as to whether or not you can answer this question. We could, in principle, need more neutron star mergers than LIGO predicts. And in fact, LIGO has now seen another neutron star merger, GW190425, and that gives this updated LIGO Virgo rate here. And also I should mention that just in June of this year, there was a confirmation of two neutron star black hole mergers that happened last year within 10 days of each other. So all of these things that LIGO is starting to see more and more and show more and more, it's very exciting times for the R process because LIGO is what is going to give us the answer to this question of how frequently mergers occur. And then that can be coupled with light curves and abundances to understand if mergers could be the source of heavy elements in our solar system. Okay, so here I would say is a good place to take a break, go have a coffee. I'm gonna do the same. Please, if you have any questions in mind right now, write them down so that we can discuss them during the Q&A. And I look forward to talking about our process calculations with you in the second half of this lecture. See you soon.